Where once they stood, we stand. In Newfoundland, we remember those who came before us. Tonight, we're going to tell you some stories of the spirits that won't let us forget, because they're still here. Welcome to Tales from the Mist. On Strawberry Marsh Road, there is an inconspicuous brick government building. From its exterior, it certainly doesn't look like a home for ghosts. But as we know, looks can be deceiving. Before the patent building housed government employees, it was called the Exxon House, a home for developmentally delayed children. Before it was the Exxon House, it was the site of an Anglican orphanage. Lives were lived and lost inside these walls, and some of their voices remain. One evening, a staff member was working late in the office, trying to prepare for a meeting first thing in the morning. They heard what sounded like children running down the hall and giggling. I think she does. I think she sees us. She saw us. <laughs> I think she saw us. The first thought was that a colleague had returned with children, maybe just to grab a file. She continued to work and tried to ignore the children's laughter, but it continued for at least 10 minutes. Finally, she got up and went into the hall to investigate. There was no one in the hall. It was completely empty. She was sure she was hearing children, so she went to the other wing and called out. Hello? Who's in there? No response. Everything was quiet. Even louder. Who is here? She went back to her office, thinking she had missed whoever was there and really needed a break. Back at her keyboard. She had just started to write again when she heard giggling. Only this time it was louder. Right outside her door. She thought, one of the guys is here and trying to scare me. It's not going to work, she yelled out and tried to ignore it. Finally she got up and looked again. No one. All the office doors were closed. No one was in these cubicles. She even went downstairs to check the login book. No one had signed in. And all the lights were off. Now she was really getting suspicious. She went back to her office and just sat there for a minute. Her skin was tingling. She remembered that this had been a home for children delayed children. Some had died here. Imagine someone coming to your house every day uninvited, with small crying children. No one believes you, and they don't even see or hear them. Our next story has a frustrated grandmother trying to get someone to tell the visitors to leave. To this day, we don't know if they did. Rolanda grew up on Queens Road in an old three-story house. A family lived on the main floor apartment, her nan lived in the second floor apartment, and Rolanda's family lived on the top floor. 
Rolanda and her sister would come home to lunch every day from school, and her nan would make them soup or a sandwich. Some days the girls would come home to lunch and their nan would greet them by telling them a lady went upstairs and to go check and, and see who it was. She would tell them that there were babies crying there all morning. Their nan was a large assertive woman and they would go up and look for the woman and the babies. Of course, there was never anybody up there. This routine continued for a very, very long time. It certainly wasn't every day, but frequently enough that Roland and her sister became rather used to it. Over time, their fear of finding someone up there turned to annoyance and, at some point, amusement. They thought Nan was losing it. This was the only thing that was not right with their Nan, otherwise she was very sane and competent. The girls couldn't understand why she kept asking them after this mysterious woman and her crying babies. Fifteen years later, at university, Rolanda's father sends her a book written by Jack Fitzgerald. Her dad had put a yellow sticky note on the side of one of the pages with a note saying, Read this. Bear in mind her dad never sent her mail. This is the only thing he has ever sent her in her entire life. Curious, she opened it up to read the story. It was her old house with her old address on it. Apparently, a lady killed her two babies upstairs on the third floor in that house. They were very small, tiny little things. She had murdered them and put them in a box. She called a taxi to bring her through some wooded area where she burned the box. The taxi driver alerted the police and they found the children's little bodies. The babies that were crying in Rolanda Nan's head were those babies. And the woman, well, her soul is not at rest. They had never heard of the murders in their house. They had no idea of the history of the place until somebody gave her dad that book as a Christmas gift. The gift giver had no idea about the ladies and the babies that Rolanda's Nan had so frequently spoken of. Unfortunately, Rolanda's Nan died in 1992 and her father didn't get the book until the Christmas of 1995. Rolanda's Nan died without ever knowing the real story behind her visions. The Masonic Temple is a landmark in St. John's. The building is now a performing arts center owned by Spirit of Newfoundland. But the past owners and strange rituals, basement family dwellers, have left phantoms waiting in the wings for their chance in the spotlight. Peter Halley tells us more. Yeah, the Masons lived here until six years ago. So it was a, a it was, the, and still is, the Masonic Temple, um, but they inhabited. Previous to getting this building, we had rented from the Masons. So we had done many shows, and uh, every now and then, one of the guys, who shall remain nameless, would let us up into the, the lodge room, and we would want to go up and play the organ there, and, and just sort of get the sense and the vibe in that room, because was, there was always a, a mystique about it, you know, about the whole building, of course, but that room in particular, there was, you know, not open to the public, so like school children, we had to get in that room and, uh, and you know, play Phantom of the Opera on the organ. Then we purchased the building. And uh, the very first night that we got the building, 
uh, the Masons had moved all of their material, all their furniture and pictures out, and we invited you know, 40, 50 people uh, impromptu to come into the building to celebrate. We were having champagne. We got the building. And uh, so it was an idea, like, how about we go up in the lodge room where people weren't ever allowed, and we did. And, uh, and it's just that energy in the room, and people were asking us what the, this, uh, the tiles were for and the, uh, this, the, the eye and all the symbols. I took my dog and my friend's dog, and we were explaining the, the, um, the, the uh, platform in the middle of the floor, the tile. And we noticed that the dogs weren't going on that. They weren't, and we were, so we called them, come on, come on, come on. And they ran around this thing, and they were like barking. And everybody sort of got really intrigued, and we started throwing uh, uh, cheesies. And, and they really wanted to go get these cheesies, but there was, they weren't going to step on this. And, and so we were all, ooh, this is crazy. A lot of the wedding pictures that are taken here with the bride and groom, it's, there are unexplained orbs around the pictures. And uh, I sort of not believed when this caretaker was telling me, you know, uh, that a lot of the brides and grooms um, had complained about these, their pictures not coming out the way they wanted and, and didn't know what these things were in the pictures until a friend of mine got married here. And sure enough, um, all of these things in the pictures, uh, just unexplained, almost like, you know, when kids blow those bubbles looked like there were bubbles, but there weren't any bubbles in the scene, you know? They were there. I happened to be in the mall, and I ran into this girl who I had known from years before, and she said, how are things going at the Masonic? And, and um, I said, you know, well, we had just moved from a previous venue, but a lot of the people um, that would come to see us still thought we were at this other venue. So business that year was a little slow, and transitionally, it wasn't the smoothest. smoothest. So she said, you know, I'd been thinking of you and, um, you know, the Masonic, and have you ever thought about getting it cleansed? And I was, you know, we have cleaners all the time, ha ha. Um, anyway, so she made the arrangements. I didn't, I didn't talk further with her that night about it, but she called a little while later and she said that there were some priests that were coming to St. John's to do this uh, workshop uh, at Holy Heart, and there were thousands of people over two nights that were coming to do this. And she wondered if they could come down and visit. I said, sure. Uh, three priests and herself. And uh, they came in and myself and my business partner were here and they, they came through the building and uh, they were sort of looking at each other and, and communicating that way. And we were curious about what they were saying to each other without really saying anything. <clears throat> Asked if I was a baptized Christian, Catholic. I, I said I was. My business partner, Kathy, <laughs> wasn't Catholic. So they said, if you don't mind, we'll allow Peter to come into the room and when we go into the lodge room. So they went up there, they had their robes on, and one of them said when we came in, uh, when they walked in, they said, did you feel that? And the other priest said, I did. And one of them said, we, we don't like it, they don't like it that we're here. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is interesting. They literally did a, um, an exorcism, you know, um, and they sort of, uh, cast energies out of the room and sprayed holy water and you know gave us some suggestions to cover up some of the some of the symbols um, I sort of took it very lightly but you know you're curious as well because you just don't if someone is convincing enough about what they believe then you go oh well, I'm gonna you know I'll go along with that sure um, and it was just after that point that everything sort of turned around for us the energy in the building was we thought uh, much better um, business certainly turned around and has really increased and, and you know and sort of went on the right path almost right after that you know some people have come in and said they've heard music and oh I think I just saw someone and you know you take it with a grain of salt this man was moving legal files into the building it was hired uh, by a company that was using our room for storage and uh, Several of the men had already gone up over the stairs and he came up with a box and said to this man, where do I, he hadn't been in the room yet, where do I lay these? And the guy, he said, just looked at him and then uh, he vanished. So he came down over the stairs and went outside and said, I'm not, you know, I'm not going back in there. And so we went out and investigated why and he told us that this is what had happened. He went up with the box and he saw this guy as large as life in front of him and he said where do I put these 
and he vanished. And uh, it, he was really funny. He said, you know, I need a cigarette and my nerves are shot. Um, and this is what we've heard from a few people. He said that he was uh, a man and uh, he was tall and he wore a black coat. Um, other than that, that's, that was the description. And, uh, and that he, when he, he described this vanishing as, um, you know, the top part of his, of his body started to vanish and then it sort of went this way and he, he was looking, thinking, this is crazy. He dropped the box, ran over the stairs, was completely, he was completely disturbed by this, you know. He was white and he was freaked out and he was, he, he was fully convinced that he had, he had seen a ghost and he had spoken to the ghost and the ghost vanished in front of his eyes. Caretaker of the building for the last 15 years, John Warren, um, he has notions of who it is. Uh, various uh, masons throughout the years. Um, I don't know, the, the building used to, um, the, the caretaker of the building used to live in the basement of this building and, and some of them raised their families here. So I think uh, the old uh, care uh, caretaker of the building feels as if it was one of the people that used to live here and he's still in the building. A few times our, we get a call from the alarm company and uh, they say, your alarm is stripped and um, it's happened a few times. We come down, nothing is disturbed, no one has entered a code, um, you know, and we have no explanation. And that's happened, that's happened a number of times, right up until last week. I got a call uh, from the company who's out of the province saying, you know, your alarm is stripped, uh, it seems to have stopped. It came on and it stopped. So someone probably turned it off. Um, but when we came down, there was nothing disturbed and the alarm was still, you know, set. Just across the street from the Masonic Temple is another St. John's landmark. St. John the Baptist Anglican Cathedral is a beautiful example of Gothic architecture. In its courtyard is a cemetery where you may not want to find yourself alone at night. The first cemetery in St. John's was this churchyard. There are burial records for the cemetery found in the parish records. It's estimated that there are 2,000 records, but about 6,000 people are buried there. As this is the only consecrated burial ground for St. John's, prior to 1809, many people of other religions wanted their loved ones buried on consecrated land, so they would sneak in at the night and bury the bodies, as they did not want the Church of England minister burying their Roman Catholic relatives. There are only a few headstones still standing. Most are buried in the ground, and a few have been moved elsewhere, to where we don't know. The present cathedral was begun in 1847 by Edward Field, the second bishop of Newfoundland. Bishop Field commissioned plans from a leading Gothic revival architect, George Gilbert Scott, who envisioned a more impressive structure with varied ornamentation in the 12th century English style. The nave, built between 1847 and 1850, served as the entire cathedral church for 35 years. Scott's assistant, architect William Hay, oversaw the nave's construction. Construction on the choir and transept section did not commence until 1880 and was completed in September 1885 under the direction of James Kelly. The additions to the nave gave the cathedral the shape of a Latin cross and continued the era of Gothic revival architecture. On July 8, 1892, the cathedral was extensively damaged in the Great Fire of 1892. The roof timbers ignited, which caused the roof to collapse, bringing the celestial walls and piers in the nave down with it. Many stone gargoyles watched the services over the years. The most interesting is that the oldest gargoyle located in the south transept is approximately a thousand years old. It came from the roof of a Bristol cathedral, a gift from the Diocese of Bristol. The cathedral also has numerous other plaques, relics, and historic pieces of stonework, as well as a museum and archives. In the archives, there is a very interesting photo. During the completion of the rebuilding, a workman fell off a scaffold and to his death. Upon completion, the crew dressed in their Sunday best and posed for a picture. They did not notice their workmate had joined them. If you look carefully, 
you can see him, still dressed in his work clothes. The Dean stresses that the cathedral is only haunted by the Holy Spirit. Still, take a walk around the cemetery late at night and tell us what you think. We hope you've enjoyed these tales. The next time a shadow moves in the corner of your eye, just out of sight, or you hear something you can't explain, just remember to tell a good story about it.